everyone. Welcome, Cosmos to be live TV. Uh, I'm Mark Brown. Uh, episode 17. Uh, we've got our, our uh, veteran uh, uh, guy here, <laughs> Tim Sander. This is what your third. I think your third appearance on the show. I think so. Think. Yeah. Uh, third, fourth, fourth actually. Did query, is it four? So we did query indexing. I think did we do one on change feed? We did query indexing, and then, uh, feed, and then uh, we did one at build, and then this will be this will be the fourth. Oh right. So oh, for right. three and a half. Yeah. yeah. So, don't build it. Part of one. Three. <laughs> <laughs> no build counts as a whole one. Uh, uh, yeah. So thanks for coming back, uh, folks. If you watched a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Mei Chin. Uh, she talked about the new dedicated gateway and uh, uh, an integrated cache. Uh, more of a behind the scenes, like, you know, how did they build this thing and kind of the challenges in that. And then uh, I wanted to bring Tim back uh, to talk about the cache itself uh, and how you'd use it and why you'd use it and all kinds of other kind of the parts that you would touch and feel and use and all that stuff. So uh, thanks, Tim, for for coming back uh, this week. Uh, how's your uh, how's your weather up there in Seattle? Is it cool? <laughs> off yet? Um, it's, a, it's a bit cooler. I mean, it was like. 75 or so last night which was pretty nice um actually cool enough that that i almost needed a jacket which was a little a little unexpected <laughs> so. i think that's uh i think that's just relative because you were sitting in 100 degrees or whatever it was so uh relative to that yeah sure but i mean it's nice. cool. it, if this had been two days ago you'd hear like the roaring of fans nearby like i have like you don't see it here but there's like 30 fans pointed at me <laughs> on the other parts of my office so it's, it's nice that it's that it's cooled down uh, quite a bit. Um, but anyway, yeah. let's do it. Um, so today we'll talk about yes. the Cosmos DB integrated cache. Um, and before we, we dive into the details of the feature, um, we'll just talk a little bit about the problem, right? And really broadly, uh, why do developers cache data, right? Like what reasons would you want to cache data in any application? Um, I'll, I'll turn it to you, Mark. Any you want to throw throw one reason out there that someone might want to cache data? There's lots of reasons. I mean, I've been doing web development since well for a long time, uh, and you want to do it for speed primarily because yeah. the closer you can get your data, the lower the latency is. Right? Um, calls to a database are expensive and can take a long time. So if you've got data that you're going to use over and over and over again. You always want to cache it up in memory, or at least in some kind of local storage on startup, uh, so that you can access it uh, and get it quickly. So, so that's a big reason I think uh, why you do it is just the speed. Yeah, I mean, very broadly, I'd say I, I mean you kind of covered at, at a high level both reasons, right? Speed, and then you you mentioned expensive, right? Cost. I mean, nobody likes expensive queries, nobody likes expensive reads, nobody wants to spend all their money on their database, and I mean, historically, caching has been the solution for, for both of these, right? So um, you want to, if you have a lot of repeated reads, I mean, caching will allow you to reduce the number of calls to the backend database. Um, so at a high level, we'll categorize the reasons that you want to cache data uh, into uh, latency related and cost savings related. Now, the good news is uh, for a lot of Cosmos DB customers, Cosmos DB, as it is, without caching, actually, I mean, it just solves the latency component. Um, a lot of queries, a lot of key value lookups, which we call point reads, they're going to have latency that's well under 100 milliseconds, and in most cases, actually under 10 milliseconds. And there's, I mean, for, for almost every application out there, I mean, a few milliseconds of latency is, is more than low enough. Um, so for Cosmos DB, of course, if you wanted low latency, you, you can cache data, but it's actually pretty unlikely to improve things beyond what you're already getting just because, I mean, the latency is so crazy low to begin with. So with our integrated cache sure. feature, like for point point read, that, you're already, we're going to give you that single digit, right? So right, we're already right. going to get, I mean, that's, we're already designed for that low latency, right? So right. Uh, I totally hear uh, you there. It's, it's hard to be point reads in Cosmos DB. And we've actually found that a lot of customers out there that previously used uh, a cache plus a separate database actually moved to Cosmos DB and just got rid of their cache entirely. Um, and if, if that's your case, um, that's awesome, right? I mean, the best option is just to not need caching and just to use your database. 
So the integrated cache is not aimed at lower latency. Um, in some cases, it might help latency, but the main reason we built this feature was to give customers lower costs to really read heavy workloads on Cosmos DB. Um, so the next question I have for you, Mark, is I mean, what are some common challenges you'd face if you had to add caching to an existing application? Uh, well, first, you, you got to implement it. So right. that's one thing. You have to have <laughs> devs writing code. I mean, I mean you know, I mean, it's not that hard, but you still, it's still work you've got to do, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you have to have, if you wanted to yeah. add cash to your application, you have to have, I mean, your dev team writing additional code, right? Which takes time. And you have to worry about, oh, are these calls going to our database or are they going to the cache? Is the cache getting populated with data? You have to worry about cache eviction, um, right? I mean, there, there's additional code that you need to write that you're responsible for um, if you wanted to add caching to an existing workload, whether it's on Cosmos DB, um, SQL, or a, 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 a different database. Uh, so this is what we want to also solve with the integrated cache. We want to give customers a way to add caching to an existing Cosmos DB workload without having to manage a separate cache and without having to make really any code changes at all. So the integrated cache is specifically uh, optimized for use with Cosmos DB. So all of these benefits around caching without code changes and caching without actually having to worry about a cache, um, all of that's possible because the integrated cache is built specifically for Cosmos DB. And you'll actually see later on in, in our talk today how it's literally built into Cosmos DB. So it, unfortunately, and, and we wish this was the case, it's not something that you can just go plug in with any other database out there. It's aimed at a, a, at a Cosmos DB workload, a Cosmos DB uh, developer that wants to lower their Cosmos DB costs, or potentially the latency if they had a high latency query. And it's pretty cool. It actually uses the same SDK as the rest of your Cosmos DB data. So regardless of which SDK you use, Regardless of the version, if you're using the .NET SDK from three years ago, you can still use this feature. Uh, if you're using the latest and greatest preview SDK, um, same thing. I mean, it's all you really need to do is, is change your connection string, and you can automatically leverage the benefits of caching without changing really any other parts of your code. Um, and of course, because it's Cosmos DB, um, and we're, we, we love uh, global distribution and multi-region support, uh, the feature comes with multi-region support baked in. So if you have a Cosmos DB account in multiple regions, um, you don't have to worry about, oh, I have to provision the cache in each region. Uh, no, it's uh, automatically you'll get an instance uh, in each region if your, your Cosmos DB backend data is in each. Now, to use the integrated cache, you're actually going to first provision a dedicated gateway. Um, and basically, you want to think of the dedicated gateway as basically uh, compute that server side that's dedicated to you. Uh, and this gateway, as the name suggests, is a gateway for, for routing requests and caching data that's dedicated specifically to your Cosmos DB account. Um, so the dedicated gateway um, basically is optional to provision, right? You don't have to provision it. But if you go and provision it, we'll give you a new connection string that's compatible with the dedicated gateway. And on that dedicated gateway, you'll basically have an instance of the integrated cache automatically provisioned for you to use. Now down the road, uh, we actually don't talk about this too much in, in docs and too much in material like that. Down the road, we have a lot of other cool ideas for I mean, ways the dedicated gateway could be useful for your workload, even in the absence of caching. Um, so right now, the integrated cache is I mean, the only feature that'll use the dedicated gateway. There's a lot of other cool ideas we have down the road, uh, like increased uh, better better performance, better query performance, new query features uh, that will be able to utilize this dedicated gateway um, infrastructure that you'll you'll have provisioned. Now it's it's good to call out that this is uh, provisioned at the account level, so you provision one dedicated gateway for your entire Cosmos DB account. So you don't need to go and provision one. Uh, for each container, it's provisioned at the entire uh, account level. So you just provision one per account. Right now, we have three sizes available here, D4, D8s, and D16s um, that each have a different amount of CPU and memory. Most cases, the SKU that you pick is going to be based on the amount of memory that you want to cache. So if you're, you're not caching very much data, 
Um, I mean, one D4SQ is probably going to be more than enough. Uh, but if you wanted to, let's say, cache a lot of data, particularly queries, uh, you'd want to go for one of the bigger, bigger tiers. Now, that's the size. Um, you can provision more than one dedicated gateway node. In fact, you can provision up to five of them. And in most cases, the reason you want to provision more nodes is going to be for additional availability or being able to handle uh, additional request volume. So while picking a bigger size is helpful if you want more memory available for caching, provisioning more nodes is helpful if you wanted more availability or uh, being able to handle like a greater greater read throughput, right, for for cache requests. Oh, I didn't realize you could you could do multiple nodes of this thing. Um, so that <clears throat> you got multiple nodes, and I'm guessing the dedicated gateway knows how to route. Uh, the request to a particular node. There must be some kind of mapping, I'm guessing, going on, right, in terms of where to find that data for that's in that's been cached. Yeah. So, and this is actually something that we want to improve over time as we evolve through the preview. So, we actually really welcome user feedback in this area for kind of the direction that we go and what we what we invest in. Um, as of now, at this moment, each dedicated gateway is independent from the others. So, if you provision one dedicated gateway node, basically there's a 100% a chance that your read is going to be routed through that dedicated gateway node. If you provision two dedicated gateway nodes, basically each node uh, will handle a, a portion of your, your, uh, your requests that are routed through the dedicated gateway. So the data that will actually be cached on each node is independent from one another. Um, so just because your request went through node one doesn't mean it went through node two and is, is cached there. Um, this is this is definitely something that we want to improve over time, but it's definitely good to call this out uh, because I mean, in order to benefit from the feature, you you do need a, a pretty large number of repeated reads. So if you don't have reads that repeat themselves very much, and you go and provision five nodes of dedicated gateway, I mean, because there's five nodes, it's, it's actually possible that maybe even though the repeated reads occasionally happen, um, they might not actually get routed through the same node. Um, so for HA scenarios, scenarios where you want to provision the de dedicated gateway with high availability, uh, we don't recommend provisioning just one node. We generally would recommend provisioning three or more nodes. Um, so for these scenarios, it, it's good to understand that uh, the dedicated gateways, uh, they don't replicate data between them. So you would have to wait for the, the uh, read to get routed through that dedicated gateway node before the data is cached there. Um, the good news is this does mean that if, let's say, uh, there was an outage, and let's say a particular dedicated gateway node is unavailable. Um, the others, I mean, they're independent from one another, right? So they can can easily, I mean, handle your workload without really much notice or much interruption. Now, next thing I'll show is how to provision a dedicated gateway. So I'll exit PowerPoint and actually just jump into. Um, uh, this is sample Cosmos DB account that I provision. So you can go and provision the dedicated gateway right in the Azure portal. So here I have a dedicated gateway tab. And uh, I'll go in and just show the provisioning experience for going and adding a dedicated gateway. Now, in most cases, you, you will add more than one dedicated gateway. If you were looking to use this in production. So I mean, you'd effectively be adding a dedicated gateway cluster, right? A cluster of one or more dedicated gateways. Uh, right now, you can provision up to five dedicated gateway nodes within a cluster. Um, in this case, we'll just say we want to provision uh, three. You can also pick the size between D8, uh, D4, D8, and D16. Um, and when you, you go and you hit save, it just takes about five minutes or so for these dedicated gateway nodes to be, um, to be provisioned. Uh, they're independent from your RUs and your existing data. Uh, you basically want to think of it as something that goes in front of uh, the rest of your, your backend partitions um, that will go in, in route requests and, and cache data. Now, will um, those things change when I provision a gateway? Does that change the, the endpoint that I'm then going to connect to? Yeah, it's a really great point. So let's say you wrote a Cosmos DB app that you, you're very happy with and, and works well. Odds are, if you used our .NET SDK, it was using something called uh, direct mode, direct con connectivity mode, where you basically are connecting and talking directly to the backing partitions on, on Cosmos DB. 
Now, if you go and provision a dedicated gateway and you, you want to use that, you'll get a new connection string, right? Like you mentioned, a new connection string that's specific to the dedicated gateway. So you want to make sure you go in your code and you, you change out your old connection string for a connection string that's specific to this new dedicated gateway. You'll also want to make sure if you were using direct mode before, you switch to gateway mode um, so that you tell the Cosmos client that you want requests from your app to first be routed through the dedicated gateway before uh, the, before they're sent to backend nodes. Um, so basically, before your app would just so connect directly to the and now it connects to the gateway. Sorry. Just, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that's a that would be a change because the default now is going through direct mode. So people would have to uh, go and make sure that their connection mode is using is specifically calling gateway, uh, and then of course the change to the endpoint. That's right, and that'll that'll depend if you're using one of the old SDKs or a new SDK. Um, so if you're actually someone that's used Cosmos DB for a while, you might be used to our old SDKs, which defaulted to to gateway mode. Um, the new SDKs actually default to direct mode. So if you're using uh, one of the the relatively new SDKs, you'll you'll definitely want to make sure you make that change and switch to gateway mode. Um, so so far, there's just two lines oh, of code. I can, use, I can use V2 SDK. Oh, you can use whatever version you'd like. Yeah. Um, so there's there's nothing in this feature that depends on SDK. So we wanted to build a feature okay. that, from the user's perspective, um, a caching feature that, from the user's perspective, was effectively the same as the backend, right? So your SDK, when it sends a query to Cosmos DB and gets the results back, the way it handles that request and the way you'd write code as a Cosmos DB developer is exactly the same, regardless of whether the request goes to the backend directly, to the dedicated gateway, or to the dedicated gateway and then hits the cache. All that's exactly the same. Um, and that's, that's, I mean, that's the value of the features that we're able to do that. Um, so because of that, like a, a good, good byproduct of that is it doesn't have, it doesn't have any dependencies on the SDK. So, I mean, you're using Python V1 SDK from years and years ago, um, or Java V2 from years and years ago, doesn't matter. You can still use the dedicated gateway feature and, and connect to it and leverage the benefits of caching. Um, now we will introduce some, and I like to call these like, uh, um, I don't know, like, um, what's what's the word, like uh, extras, right? Like features that you don't absolutely need to use the feature, but I mean they might be helpful, right, to improve the usefulness of it. These won't necessarily be added to every single SDK version. Um, so for example, we have a uh, a new uh, attribute called max integrated cache staleness which you'll set on a per request level. And it allows you to basically uh, set an upper bound on the, the maximum staleness of, of reads that are served from the cache. This is configurable in the SDK, but it's only configurable in the newest versions, uh, simply because we can't re-release an SDK version that, I mean, has this, this property there. Um, but other than that, like the core use of the feature doesn't have any dependency at all on SDK versions. Um, so let's say you, you try out the feature, you provision it like I just did, and you change your app to go and connect to the dedicated gateway. Basically, all requests now will get routed to the dedicated gateway. And where possible, um, when there's data in the cache, we'll go and we'll hit the cache uh, before going to the back end. And any requests that use the cache and don't need to go to the back end are going to have an RU charge of zero, like literally zero. Uh, so that'll mean like they're effectively, I mean, free, right? They don't use your RUs. Um, they don't they don't really cost too much at all. Um, now there's two components of the the cache, the item cache uh, and the query cache. The item cache caches reads and the query cache caches queries. So basically for the item cache, we'll cache a particular key value lookup um, based on the item ID. So if you, let's say, try to read the same item multiple times, we'll go and cache uh, subsequent reads of that, that item. Uh, for the query cache, we basically transform the query into a key value lookup where the key is the query and the value is the um, basically the, the query text. Or the key is the, the query text and the value is the query result. So if you go and you run the same query later on, or run the same query again and again, uh, you'll basically 
um, get future right executions of that query for free. Now, both the also, item they also use the continuation token as well, right? As part of the key for that for that query. Yeah. So I mean, because the feature, and I'm actually going to open my door. Make it a bit cooler since the heat's picking up. Um, because the query cache <laughs> is um, because the query cache is built into Cosmos DB. Uh, we're able to cache a lot of things like continuation tokens, which other caches for other databases just might not be able to do. Um, so when you run a query, uh, if the query results span multiple pages, you actually get a continuation token after the first uh, first page of execution. Um, this will actually automatically be cached. So if you had a scenario where you have a query, let's say, that has three pages of results, and you end up caching the first page but not the later two, if you later rerun the same query, get the first page of results from the cache and want to go to the next page, uh, what we'll actually do is, I mean, we'll leverage that continuation token that we'll, we've cached and basically go and, and pick up where we left off. So it would effectively be the same as if we went and ran the query normally and got the continuation token. So we, we basically save the extra work of having to re, uh, rerun like the first continuation, the first page of the query. All that's automatic, so you actually don't really need to understand how that works. You don't need to think about it. The best practices around paging with queries is exactly the same whether the query goes to the cache or the back end. All you want to think about as a developer that's using the cache is the consistency requirements around your data, um, which you can set through, I mean, configuring the consistency for, for your request or configuring the max integrated cache staleness um, for each request individually. Uh, now, the max integrated cache staleness is basically a setting that decides the, the max staleness, right, that we're, we'd be willing to, to tolerate for cache data. So if you set the max integrated cache staleness to five minutes, you basically get a guarantee that no data from that query, whether it goes to the cache uh, or the back end, uh, will be more than, than five minutes old. So even if you're using eventual consistency, um, which, I mean, doesn't, doesn't guarantee much around consistency, you can place an upper bound on the staleness of cache data by configuring the max integrated cache staleness for, uh, for, for different reads that go to the cache. So when it hits that max staleness, <clears throat> it just evicts the data, though. It doesn't, re, it doesn't rehydrate the cache, right? <clears throat> yeah. So that day, you'll get a hit. You're going to get a cache miss, and then, and then it'll rehydrate on the return, on, on the response, right? It will. That's correct. That that's exactly right. And it, it's actually really good to to call out how this works. Is it is a little bit different than like how TTL normally works with caches. We're we're basically enforcing the consistency on the read path rather than uh, when you go and initially send the request to the cache. Um, so let's say uh, right now, um, we'll say it's uh, I guess it's it's one twenty three Pacific time. Let's say I go and I send a request to the cache. I go and I send a query um, to the cache. If I, let's say, rerun the query at 125 Pacific time, so two minutes from now, and I set a max integrated cache staleness of 10 minutes, I'm going to hit the cache because, I mean, the data is two minutes old. I, I told the cache my request. I only want to get data that's up to 10 minutes old. I'll basically get that data back. Uh, now, if I come back an hour later and I run the same query, but again with the max integrated cache staleness of 10, one hour is, is obviously a lot longer than 10 minutes. So in that type of scenario, um, like, like you mentioned, it'd be a cache miss, right? We won't use the cache because the data is old enough. Um, we'll go to the back end, run the query as normal. Uh, but when we do that, I mean, we will repopulate the cache with the, the updated query after that. So if you were to run the query immediately after that, it'll, it'll go and it'll hit the cache. Um, that's different than a lot of caches work because the data is actually still in the cache until we issue a read that goes and um, basically uh, evicts the, the old data, right? So if we, let's say, um, issue a query and then never query it again, th the data would actually be there until the space is needed in the cache, right? Until it's evicted via LRU, until it's the least recently used item in the cache, it'll actually stay there. Um, so, I mean, this doesn't really affect how you'd use it, right? I mean, your, your TTL is your TTL, um, but because you configure it on the read path, it allows you to potentially uh, configure 
a different different consistency requirements for different types of requests and different types of queries. So it allows a little more customizability. If maybe let's say some queries you want to have a certain TTL and other queries you want to let's say have a lower TTL um, because they have more strict consistency requirements. Um, most common use cases of the integrated cache uh, is going to be related to cost. Like, like we mentioned, right? I mean, there's two reasons you'd want to cache data, saving money uh, and lower latency. And the main benefits of the integrated cache, because Cosmos DB latency is so low to begin with, is just going to be around cost savings. Now, lower latency is a, a certainly good reason to use the cache. And it's going to be most noticeable with repeated queries. I mean, it's, it's tough to beat the existing latency of point reads in Cosmos DB. They're already, I mean, three to four milliseconds, and often even less than that. Queries, on the other hand, could be could be slower. Um, so for high latency repeated queries, while they are rare in Cosmos DB, the integrated cache I mean, could, could be a good way to optimize that. Also really helpful if you have a hot partition key. Hot partition keys, by definition, mean you're, you're reading a lot of the same data again and again. And I mean, that property, right, can also make you a good candidate for, for caching. So if you have a hot partition key, even if it's a temporary one, um, I mean, provisioning the integrated cache might actually help mitigate or even completely solve the problem. Uh, and then finally, I mean, if you have a higher U query, that's a no brainer, like caching is a good way, good way to fix that. Uh, now, workloads that are write heavy really shouldn't think about this feature too much. I mean, there's there's really no benefits on the right path. All the benefits are when you read your data with the integrated cache. So if you don't read your data very much, if, if most of your requests are writes, I mean, it's not going to provide really any benefits, right, um, as, as would any other cache. Um, additionally, if you, if you don't repeat point reads and you don't repeat queries very much, um, like with, I mean, any other cache out there, there's, there's not many possible benefits. Um, the feature um, benefits only come if you heavily repeat the same types of queries and point reads again and again. We find this this pattern to be pretty common among customers. A lot of Cosmos DB workloads, I mean, might be the same four or five queries just run again and again and again. Um, and in, in this case, I mean, caching can be a really great way um, to save money, and the integrated cache can be a, a pretty turnkey way to, to, I mean, to start caching. Uh, and then finally, right now, the cache is eventual consistency only. Down the road, we definitely want to support session consistency as well, which will be a nice addition. But it's good to call out that, I mean, if you have strict, strong consistency requirements, as with caching with any other product, um, you definitely want to be careful. Um, it might not be a good fit for, for caching all your data. Maybe there's only a, a subset of it that's OK with the, the relaxed consistency. Cool. Hey, um, a question from a viewer here. Yeah. Uh, what can invalidate the query cache or item cache? What if they change? Um, I think we were just talking about that. I mean, there's basically data that's max the TTL in there is going to be well invalidated or TTL'd off, I guess. And like you said, it doesn't it doesn't actually TTL it off, but when the request comes in and it's older then what you said in there, it's going to basically go back to the back end and grab the fresher data. So, right. Right. Yeah. If it I mean, change, it's not going to matter because it's still going to follow the max staleness that you set, if you set it in the, re mm -hmm. in the request, right? Right. And that's how, that's how queries work. So, so for there's, queries, there's... for queries, if you, if you read data, and it's not in the cache, we'll go and we'll execute it on the back end. Or like you mentioned, if you read data and it's it's in the cache, but it's it's too stale, we'll go and we'll we'll run the query on the back end as normal. And then following that execution, we'll we'll populate it in the cache, right? So uh, we basically read through the cache to the back end, run the query, and then store the data in the cache after that for I mean any repeated reads. We do that with items as well. So I mean that is also how the item cache works. The item cache, there's one exception, and this is actually a, a perfect transition into this slide here. If you go and you write data through the dedicated gateway, uh, we'll actually go if, and, and uh, cache it in the item cache. So if you, let's say, uh, wrote this sample document here, 
ID doc A, partition key A, and name Tim. If you wrote it through the dedicated gateway node, it will persist it in the cache. Um, so if you go and you write another one uh, with Luis, write it to Cosmos DB, we'll also store it in the cache. Uh, so then if you go and issue a read, even though you hadn't issued this read yet, it'll go to the cache first. Uh, and because the write was done through the dedicated gateway endpoint, we went in and we cached that, that data and we'll go and return that doc back to the client without actually having to go, go and use any RUs. So it's a nice bonus for the item cache. Um, it's not, I mean, it's not always going to be that impactful unless you're constantly ingesting data. So in most cases, it probably will be on reads that we go and end up populating the cache. But if you do ingest a lot of data and then immediately read it, I mean, this can be a helpful way to avoid that initial cache miss. Um, if you go and you, you read data that's not yet in the cache, like just like I mentioned, and just like the query cache works, we'll go and we'll do that read on the back end. So it's effectively a cache miss. Uh, and then following that, we'll go and store it in the cache for future use. So if I were to issue a subsequent read of .c, we'll go to the cache and we won't need to go to the back end. Uh, now, if I go and I, I update a document, so if I want to update doc A and change the name value from Tim to Andy, if I route that through a dedicated gateway node, um, basically, we will do that update, of course, with eventual consistency in the integrated cache. Um, so that can be another good way um, to, I mean, improve the consistency of data within the cache. Of course, the, the way you'll get a guarantee around it is with the max integrated cache staleness. So if you have, I mean, consistency requirements, that is how you want to manage it. Um, but as an added bonus, if you're doing a lot of point reads and you're relying on the cache for those, uh, if the request is routed through the dedicated gateway, we will go and update the cache. Uh, for queries, uh, we will only populate the cache on read. So if you go and you you read data um, and route it through the integrated cache and you read it with the query, basically what we'll do uh, is if the data is in the cache, um, we'll return it back and not need to use any of your RUs. But if the data is not in the cache, it'll get routed through the dedicated gateway. The query will get run on the back end and we'll return it back uh, to your, your app. Following that, the query will be cached. So if I go and repeat it the same query again, we will just go to the cache. We won't need to use any of your, your backend are used. Uh, so if I, let's say, do a different query that has a similar shape, maybe slightly different values, it has different results. So it's actually considered a different query. Um, so that would actually get uh, routed to the back end and be cache miss and then we go and, and cache that query separately. Um, so each of these would basically be separate entries in the cache. Um, and again, if I, if I run one of those queries and it's in the cache, we'll go and return that back to the app without using any of our backend resources, and that will literally have an RU charge of, of zero. Um, so I'll jump uh, to demo time and kind of show that, that same example um, uh, uh, a simple demo that shows cache performance. Hey, before you do, uh, I think your your Wi-Fi may have slipped off the access point you were using earlier. You've been a bit laggy. You want to check yeah. that? Yeah, I can do that. <clears throat> Let me turn my screen for a second. Let's see if you're on your Sure. I just want your demos to look snappy. <laughs> Um, cool. let me, uh, grab. Live TV folks <laughs> without a net. Cool. Uh, let me know if this is any better. I'll switch to share my screen again. Not that I'll just change rooms. That can, that's the 
and get a bit closer to it. That's the foolproof method. Um, right. Cool. Drag this guy out of the way. Um, cool. So the, the first thing that we'll do is just ingest some data through the dedicated gateway endpoint. So what I've done here is I provisioned a dedicated gateway in um, the West US2 region um, to an existing Cosmos DB account in the West US2 region. And I'm connecting with the VM in the same region. So when I run all these requests, when I run all these sample reads and writes, it's good to call out that it's all within the same region. Um, if I actually were to run these in a different region, uh, that would actually be the biggest deciding factor in latency. So the latency is so low that, it, I mean, it's just absolutely critical that if you try out this demo on your own, uh, you make sure that your VM, your data, your dedicated gateway, they're all in the same region. And the first thing I'll do is just ingest some data using the dedicated gateway endpoint. Um, this is just to show, I mean, how ingesting the data is, is pretty similar, uh, when you, regardless whether you use the dedicated gateway or um, direct mode, um, just print out sample RU charge and sample latency, pretty in line with what we, we typically, typically see. Next thing we're going to do um, is also not very exciting. We'll do 100 test point reads, but we won't do caching. We'll actually say, for these point reads, we want to go to the back end. Uh, we'll use the dedicated gateway, but we actually um, will just go directly to the back end data and run the point reads there. Uh, now, when we do this, uh, it's about 5.8 milliseconds, which is actually kind of on the high side. It's usually a little lower than that. So we got a little, little unlucky with the latency today. Um, and it costs you about one RU. So for these requests, we, we went to the back end, and it costs uh, one RU for each of these point reads, right? Because they were pretty small documents. And the, the typical latency was, was 5.8 milliseconds. The next thing I'll do um, is just repeat these, right? I'll repeat the 100 test point reads with caching. And this is where things get interesting, right? I mean, the latency probably improves a little bit, not much. I mean, it's, it improves slightly, right? 4.6 4 is better than, than 5. Um, but actually, with it, the big improvement here is the request charge, instead of being 1 RU, is now 0 RUs. Um, so if you were, let's say, issued, I'm mean, here we only issued 100 of these point reads, but let's say I issued a million, you would literally save a million RUs um, from not having to execute these point reads. Well, a million RUs is a pretty good savings uh, if you're <laughs> going to run that volume of requests there. Um, and I guess you know it makes sense what you say that look, look this isn't this isn't make this isn't useful for every workload. Like if you don't have a high volume of requests, because the savings you get in RUs is offset by the cost for the dedicated gateway and the cache. Anyway, so you kind of have to uh, you kind of have to do some math on a on some paper there and figure out you know <clears throat> how much am I consuming in throughput whether it's for point reads or queries and then figure out okay does that make you know is it make economic sense for me to use yeah uh, use the cash because what what you're saying is it's primarily going to be a cost driven uh, thing here. It is. I mean, you saw that latency improved a little bit, but. I mean, five milliseconds is five milliseconds. Like, it's it's rare that you, you really need to get much faster than that. Um, and actually, usually right. when when I run the demo, it's like two or three milliseconds. So I actually got really unlucky here. Usually, <laughs> it's even better than that. Um, but you actually get a financial fact guarantee in Cosmos DB that if I did this demo long enough, I mean, the P99 is going to be under ten milliseconds. Um, so here it actually looks like we we really tested the limit. We got pretty close. Um, but I mean, this is quite literally as, as bad as it gets. Um, and, and for, I mean, literally any application out there, um, the guaranteed latency at P99 is under 10 milliseconds. Um, so for most customers, that's that's more than enough, right? Uh, P99 latency under 10 milliseconds, average latency around four or five milliseconds. Like, that's, that's fine. Um, cost, on the other hand, I mean, you, you could be repeating millions of reads. Like, that that is not uncommon for customers to repeat millions of reads every 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 hour, right? Um, so if this was the case, I mean, the integrated cache is going to save tons of money um, since each of these just won't cost our use. Uh, now, the next thing I'll do is 100 test yeah. queries. Uh, has the internet connection gotten a bit better? No, it's the same. No? <laughs> All right, I'm going to go 
Yeah. Uh, change rooms, actually. I'm going to get a bit closer to the router. I'll turn off my camera for a minute and then um, stay here. OK. I guess while we're waiting for Tim, uh, just want to give you some upcoming information or information on some upcoming episodes. So uh, next week we're going to have uh, Lena Hall uh, with us, uh, and we're going to talk about all kinds of things around distributed systems, distributed databases, <clears throat> sharing data in the cloud, just kind of all kind of cloud trend or uh, data and cloud trend uh, topics. So should be a good. Uh, Episodes. Lena is brilliant. So if you don't know, uh, go follow her on Twitter. It's at Lena Droid, um, and uh, I mean she's been with Microsoft Research and now works over in our uh, cloud developer advocacy team. Uh, so come join us next week. That'll be fun. Uh, no demos or anything. We're just going to talk uh, about stuff. Um, but that should be a good uh, episode. Uh, so uh, there's Tim back again. Uh, do you want to share your screen uh, with us? Yeah. We'll switch back to sharing. There's this guy. Um, I don't know if it's any. Better. I, am, I am literally sitting right next to my router now, so I have very high hopes for <laughs> for this now. Um, can you see my screen again, Mark? Yeah, I can see it. So let's. Right, uh, yeah, let me focus on that. Cool. Um, so just to quickly recap, we just ran a hundred test point reads with and without caching. Now, there was a slight benefit in latency with the cache, which is, is nice, um, but the big benefit was cost. We'll repeat the same test now with 100 test queries without caching. Now, here, uh, this query actually is, is a pretty inefficient query. The query that uh, we, we chose to use here is one that uses a few inefficient system functions in Cosmos DB. And when we run this query, the average latency is 12 milliseconds, and the average RU charge for the query, about 81, millis uh, 81 RUs. So not cheap, right? If you ran this query um, 100 times, like you're, you're literally going to use um, about 8,000, right? 8,000, yeah, 8,000 8, RUs, which, I mean, could be pretty substantial if you run that 100 times each second. Now, if we go and repeat that test query, but this time it's caching, Basically what we did was we, we paid for the first query execution, right? We paid our 81 RUs, um, but we, it was like a buy one, get 99 free deal, right? All subsequent executions of the query were not only zero RUs, but they were much, much faster as well. In fact, like the, the latency here was pretty similar to what you'd see for a point read in Cosmos DB because the query basically just became a key value lookup. We transformed the query into a key value lookup where the key was the query and the value was the, the query results. Um, See, so to me, that here. seems like the kind of killer kind of feature with that thing is you got these high concurrency queries that are expensive. Maybe they're fan out queries. I don't know, but maybe you made a terrible choice in terms of your partition key, and you end up with these fan out queries that you have to run, you know, with high concurrency, and you're just getting socked with really high RU charges. This thing would be a no brainer in terms of uh, <laughs> how do I get out from underneath that and reduce my RU cost. And it, it also with the performance, I mean, the latency was, I mean, it's an order of magnitude better. Uh, so um, substantial, I would think. Uh, customers that find themselves in a situation where uh, they've made a poor choice and a partition key and, and as usually as, as often the case, they don't realize it until they've tried to scale out and they put substantial data in there. And then they end up with kind of what you're describing in terms of these expensive slow queries and they need a way to get out from underneath that. This could provide them a kind of a bridge, if you will, yeah. to allow them maybe the breathing room to go and redesign um, or repartition their data. Uh, once they, you know, if they if they know there's a better key or a better partition key for them to use, so yeah, I mean it's it's yeah. potentially more yeah. than breather room actually. Um, if you had a hot partition key, like this, actually might very well be the long term solution to the problem. Like if you found you ran the same query again and again, the yeah. same data got queried again and again, like that might actually be a pretty good thing. Like you could you could use this cache 
And the great thing about the cache is it doesn't matter whether it's a cross partition query in partition. The way the cache works is the same. So this query could have been cross partition across a thousand partitions and the request charge would still be zero. You know, you're right, uh, because what we what we do tell customers uh, is that if you have a workload that's both uh, write heavy and read heavy, and you've partitioned mm -hmm. for high cardinality, and then you realize I've got to do a lots of queries, there is no, you have one of two choices. You can either change feed it into a new container with a new mm -hmm. partition key and serve the queries that way, or or use the, the cache, I guess. So I could, you're absolutely yeah. right. This could be a, a, an effective long-term solution. Yeah, a great example actually would be, um, let's say you're a retailer, right? And you're selling lots of different products. Uh, you build an application and you decide, um, you're storing, again, information about your products. You partition it on, let's say the product ID or some unique GUID, right? Unique, unique identifier for each, each product. Um, that might be fine, right? Maybe when you're small, maybe during normal times, that might actually be a pretty good partition key. Uh, but let's say something goes on sale. Right? Like, let's say you have um, a thousand different items in your, your online store, but one of them is on sale. Obviously, that's going to get more views. It's going to get more purchases. Um, so you would expect, I mean, if you've partitioned on that, like, you have a hot partition key, right? Like, that data, I mean, it's just read and used so much more than the others that your, your partition key, while it might have been good initially, becomes a hot partition key. Um, and in those types of scenarios, it actually usually works out that, I mean, the same queries are repeating themselves over and over again, right? I mean, you're probably querying for the price, querying for information about the item again and again and again. Um, so whether it's retail, whether it's IoT, a different industry, that pattern is common. Um, so if you find yourself in that kind of situation, um, I wouldn't even say the integrated cache is like a temporary solution. Like it is, it is the solution. Like it makes that type of Workload on Cosmos DB, like incredibly cost-effective long-term, um, since you can keep that great partition key yeah. uh, for good scalability, um, and then also really easily cache data. Cool. So that's that's that demo. Um, Mark, if you wouldn't mind just sharing the link to to this demo, um, you can go and, and access this through through that AKMS link that Mark just shared. Uh, run it on your own. If you do run it. Uh, please do make sure that <clears throat> you just run everything in the same region. If I uh, ran this across regions, all of these latency numbers would be like a factor of 10 higher, right? Just because of of uh, the nature of the speed of light and things like that. Um, so, uh, I mean, try it out, test out the latency, look at the RU charges. Um, there's also two other parts of the demo where you can um, better understand the query cache and the item cache. Uh, you can go and, and ingest some sample data through here um, and, and run some sample queries as well, uh, either against the cache or the back end and kind of see how the cache works with, with different queries. Sorry, I put up the wrong, uh, I put up the wrong link. <laughs> so yes. I put up the blog and it, I've got the right one up now, so. Now the good so thing the about this feature. Um, write it down again. Oh yeah. Uh, the thing that I want to call out about this feature that's um, easily overlooked is the best demo for you to use with it is an existing app that you have for Cosmos DB. So as a Cosmos DB team, we make two kinds of features. We make some features that are aimed at attracting new customers to Cosmos DB. Um, I mean, like, for example, if we introduce like a, a new query feature or we introduce let's say uh, auto scale, right? Like auto scale is something that might attract a new user, right? Or a new customer to Cosmos DB. A new query feature um, might unblock a workload. Let's say that was previously waiting for that feature. The integrated cache is actually aimed at, I mean, existing users, right? So, I mean, literally you, people who are already using Cosmos DB, who already have successful workloads on Cosmos DB, it's aimed at making your, your Cosmos DB experience even better. Um, so of course, a new customer, a new workload can use the integrated cache for something they're building on Cosmos DB. But the value of the feature is that you can take an application that you wrote for Cosmos DB two or three years ago, spend about 10 minutes changing the connection string and provisioning the dedicated gateway like we like we showed, uh, and that's it. Like you'll, you'll see cost benefits, you'll see cost savings, um, potentially reduced latency, all with, I mean, really, really minimal effort on your part. Yeah, definitely. Speaking of cost, uh, I put up 
pricing uh, page here. If, yeah. If people want to see what the uh, what the cost is for these uh, dedicated gateway uh, with the integrated cache. Um, yeah, and then also if people want to take a look at, at uh, docs and learning more, uh, they can go here. So feel free to screen cap this uh, as well, or you can go back and if I'm going too fast, you can just catch this when the recording goes up, which will be almost immediately uh, after the show. Uh, and then also the blog post that I showed earlier, um, go and check that out as well. That's I think our, that's yeah. the announcement uh, for the integrated cache, isn't it, uh, that we wrote up? That was for at Build uh, that we did there. So uh, you can get more there. Uh, yeah, and any more? Is that it? Yeah, that, that's what I have for today. Um, if you have any questions, actually, um, there's a great feedback link. Um, actually, I might might pull up our, our, our blog here. Um, yeah, pull up ahead. the blog post. You can still see my screen, right? Yep. Cool. I'll pull it up here. Um, if you have any feedback as you're using it, uh, please do reach out to us. We would love to hear your feedback um, on things that you want in the future, things that you like about it, things that you don't like. And this is the email to send it to here. Um, I mean, I, I talked about the current state of the future, um, and it's really good to keep in mind that, I mean, we're just at the beginning of our public preview. So, I mean, if there's things you want in it, and you let us know, there's there's a really good chance that it'll make it into the future later on and, and influence our, our roadmap. Uh, the best way to describe it is, We've built the infrastructure for the future and some basic caching features. And now it's time to run, right? It's time to go and add on more advanced caching features and more specific things that, that will help different users save money on, on Cosmos DB. Uh, so any feedback, uh, this is the, the best email to, to reach out to. Very cool. All right, well, thank you, Tim, for yeah. coming back. Uh, you're, by the way, you're your uh, your signal did not get any better moving closer to your router. Okay, then it must be a, a router it, issue. Or, it didn't get uh, any better. An issue like that. <laughs> you know, I've been having issues as well. Like uh, all my Teams calls since Monday have been garbage with lots of drop oh. packets, lots of high, high high volume of jitter. And there, okay. yeah, I don't know. I need to uh, I need to do some diagnostics on my on my network and just see what's going on uh, with this thing. It's happening somewhere. So <laughs> anyway, what are you going to do, right? It's, uh, yeah. hey, I, I work in software or I work in the cloud. So the network is always going to be a whatever, something to keep an eye on. So uh, anyway, right when uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah. What's, <laughs> what's that? Well, always right when you need it. It was working fine. <laughs> yeah. Working <laughs> fine this morning. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Well, Tim, thank you very much for coming on this week. And uh, yeah. uh, we'll see you in a future episode, I'm sure. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, this week. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And like I said, we've got Lena Hall on, uh, talking about lots of cloud data trends uh, coming up. Uh, also, uh, we're getting into the summer months here, and I'm going to be taking uh, a little bit of time off. So. There may be uh, like a week, I think, in middle of July, uh, we won't have a show up. Uh, and then another week in early August, uh, we take another week off there. Uh, I'm actually taking off most of July, but I'm going to continue to do some episodes here for you guys because I don't think it's fair to take a, an entire month off and <laughs> not have a show. So we'll do episodes. I've got more scheduled up uh, there, but I do need to take some time off. Uh, so anyway. Uh, I guess those weeks where I don't have a show, you can go back and look at an older episode and get your Cosmos DB fix uh, for the week. Uh, so anyway, uh, I think that's it uh, for us this week. Uh, thanks again, Tim. And thank you, everyone, for joining us.